when this man hit those nerves in my spine, you guys, I screamed bloody murder and just immediately started sobbing. <laughs> squad welcome back to another video i have tried to film this video a thousand times and it's really hard to keep track of everything that i'm saying and not rant and ramble because that's just who i am as a person and so i'm trying to keep everything pretty clear and concise if you see me looking down i did write some notes on my phone just to kind of keep me on track and to keep me from going too far off track because this is gonna be a long video. Um, today, I'm gonna talk to you guys about my pregnancy, labor, and delivery story. Um, there's not a whole lot to say about my pregnancy, which is why I'm just kind of gonna add that into the labor and delivery. So, and I'm really sorry, I've got ratchet nails. I haven't painted them in I don't know how long. They're a mess. I need to get on that, but I have a baby, so last time I painted them, I didn't have a long enough period to let them dry, so they just got messed up, and that's my life. The other thing, too, is uh, my skin looks really good today. It doesn't. Uh, you can see it's very red and speckled right now. Um, I don't really know why it happens, but I would say at least two or three times a year. It probably has to do with weather changing and potentially every once in a while when I change my face washes. But um, right now my skin is just not working for me. So I've got a little coconut oil on it and that's all I'm doing for makeup on my face for probably a few weeks. So let's get that out of the way before we comment on this face, the skin. Um, now back to it. My um, pregnancy labor and delivery story. Whew, where do we start? So when I first got pregnant, um, I had no idea I was pregnant. I really didn't even think um, I had a very high potential of becoming pregnant. So I've talked to you guys about it before. I have PCOS. Um, one major complication of PCOS is infertility. A lot of women who have PCOS and want to get pregnant have to try for a long time and usually end up doing some form of fertility treatments just because our bodies don't like to get pregnant. Um, that really wasn't the case for me. I would say it took me maybe six months with regular activity which people are like, oh, that sounds like a long time. They say you can get pregnant like the first time you have sex. But I mean, it's pretty average. It's not really that abnormal. So um, when I got pregnant, I didn't really know. I didn't have any symptoms whatsoever. I didn't have sore breasts. I didn't have weight gain. I didn't have nausea, anything. And I had no idea even if I could be pregnant because my period was so irregular that it's not like I could be like, oh, I missed my period. Um, so because I knew I was having sex regularly, I decided to get a pregnancy test and just, you know, see if I was pregnant by chance. So, um, and this wasn't a plan either. We weren't like, oh, let's have a baby. It was just kind of like, oh, if it happens, it happens. So I went to the Dollar Tree because you know I'm a bargain queen. I like to buy things cheap. And I wasn't about to buy a fancy $10 pregnancy test unless I knew I was pregnant. So <laughs> I went to the Dollar Tree, got a dollar test. They are accurate. They do work. I know a lot of people who have used them. I use them. And it was accurate. So I got the Dollar Tree test, came home, peed, you know, did the thing. And what I'm going to tell you guys is in my experience and the experience of a lot of people that I've known to get pregnant, you don't have to wait three minutes. Um, if you're pregnant and you do a pee stick, almost as soon as that urine gets into the strip, um, the piece where the lines show up, if you're pregnant, it's usually going to show up way before three minutes. Mine showed up instantly. So um, I was like, wow, I'm pregnant. I don't know how long I've been pregnant. 
I better call my doctor. So I called my doctor and I was like, hey, um, I have a positive pregnancy test. I don't know when my last period was. It was about three months ago. Um, I don't have regular periods, so I could be a few weeks pregnant. I could be, you know, a couple months pregnant. I don't know. My doctor was like, well, um, since you don't have an exact date, we'll just have you come in like six or seven weeks from now. Me being impatient as all hell, I decided to contact the Hope Clinic, which is a clinic that does free pregnancy tests and ultrasounds to try to figure out how far along I was. So I went there still experiencing no symptoms of pregnancy, no nausea, nothing. And they ended up giving me an ultrasound because I peed positive on their stick. And my baby was just like this little teeny bean, like a little circle, um, didn't look like a human, didn't look like an alien, just looked like a little speck. Um, she said I was probably about five weeks pregnant, maybe six, but she couldn't quite see the heartbeat yet and the ultrasound was over. Uh, when the ultrasound ended, I ended up bleeding a lot and I was really freaked out that I might have been miscarrying. So I went home and um, all that night I was bleeding and it wasn't, it wasn't super, super heavy, but it wasn't light either. And this might be TMI, but I did have some like chunks come out that looked kind of like cloths, if that makes sense. Um, for those of you who have had heavier periods, you'll probably understand what like the clots look like, but I was having that and I was pretty freaked out by it. So I called my doctor the next day and I was like, hey, I got this ultrasound to see how far along I was. This is what they told me, um, but I'm really afraid I'm having a miscarriage. So my doctor got me in right away, my gynecologist, not my OB. And she came in and I was just in a really bad space. I thought I had miscarried. And from my description, she thought that was the case too, but she did an internal ultrasound. And when you're so, when you're not very far along, they do internal because you can see better than the external. So she did an internal ultrasound and she could see my baby's heart beating. So I didn't have a miscarriage and things were good. So I went home, I was a little bit paranoid about having a miscarriage. I don't know why, because I've never had one, but I just hear about them so often. And especially with somebody with PCOS, I was so fearful of that happening. Um, so we went ahead and um, just kind of lived life normally, scheduled an appointment, uh, still had no symptoms. For my entire first trimester, I was symptom free. No nausea, no pain, no nothing. I wasn't tired. Um, there was nothing going on. And also another thing I wanted to mention is there was a period in my time, period in my time, there was a period of time in my life where I was eating a fully plant-based diet and I ate that way for about six months. And this was before and during my pregnancy. So, um, first trimester, didn't really have any cravings, no symptoms there. Second trimester, oh my gosh. As soon as my second trimester hit, I was extremely lethargic, like so tired, I couldn't believe it. And on top of that, I had the world's worst nausea, like probably not the world's worst, but it felt like the worst to me, right? So I was nauseous all day, every day from the second my second trimester started until a couple weeks after my son was born. Um, I was just so nauseous. They had to give me nausea meds and the only thing that would help is taking the nausea med and sipping on water all day long. That's the only thing that would help. And when I would wake up, I was so, so, so thirsty and so nauseous. And it was so weird because I was drinking more water than I'd ever had in my entire freaking life. Like, it was insane. So that was basically how my pregnancy went. Um, after the second trimester, I was extremely tired, extremely nauseous. And then as I got into my third trimester, um, there's a hormone that goes out in your body called relaxin that kind of helps loosen everything up because you're going to have a baby. And that really started causing some hip 
pain and discomfort for me. It hurt when I walked, it hurt when I laid for too long. So those were my symptoms. Um, at almost the end of my third trimester, I was like, I think five or six weeks before I was due, I started um, getting, well, I started swelling at the beginning of my third trimester, maybe at the end of my second trimester, and I had really swollen feet and legs, and my hands were puffy, my face was puffy, and I went into the doctor and they were like, oh, just part of pregnancy, but I will check your urine to make sure I didn't have toxemia or preeclampsia, which are basically the same thing. They've also, they also checked me for gestational diabetes, all of those things. So um, he tested me for those things, I was fine, but about six weeks before I was due, he noticed my blood pressure was extremely high. Um, he took my blood pressure on an appointment that was about six weeks before I was due, and he was like, did you just run up a flight of stairs? I was like, first of all, I've never ran up a flight of stairs in my adult life, and second of all, I definitely wouldn't decide to do that on a whim when I was pregnant. So I was like, no, I came up the elevator, and then I sat in the waiting room, and I just walked, like, I don't know, a hundred feet to the office room that's it and he's like okay well your blood pressure is really high and then he had me lay down and relax and then took my blood pressure while I was laying down and relaxing my blood pressure did go down a little bit so at that point he put me on bed rest and he said you can still get up well modified bed rest he's like you can still get up to like make food go to the bathroom take a shower but for the most part I don't want you doing anything physical so I was put on bed rest um, at that point, they were like, okay, let's schedule you for a week out. Here are some signs and symptoms of high blood pressure. If you're having those, please go to the hospital if they're severe or please call in if they're mild. So um, it was my next appointment. And for my next appointment, right before I went, I was just feeling so, so sick. I vomited and I was just nauseous. I took a shower and I had what's called flashers. And it's like these little lights that kind of like stream over your vision. And they're like bright lights that have like a black background, if that makes sense. Um, and so that was right before this next appointment at like five weeks, five, I think it ended up being not quite five weeks. I think it was about four and a half, four weeks before, um, for my next appointment. And so I went in and saw him and by the way, you guys, little intermission here. Sorry if I mess up on the timeline a little bit. I'm trying to get it pretty exact, but it's been quite a while, so might be slightly skewed. Um, so anyways, I went in for this next appointment. Same thing happened. My blood pressure was pretty high, and then he laid me down and put me in a resting position to see if it would drop. This time, it really wouldn't drop. And I think I was 170 or 175 over 95 at this point. He said, I can't safely send you home on this blood pressure. And for some reason, he didn't opt to try a blood pressure med. He just sent me over to labor and delivery. So he sent me to labor and delivery. And mind you, this is about four weeks before I'm supposed to have my little baby. Um, he sent me over to labor and delivery and they got me up right away. And then they hooked me up to machines. So they wanted to see if with prolonged rest, if my blood pressure would go down. Um, so I think, I think they did that for about two hours. So I was laying there and they were taking my blood pressure. I think it's either, I think it was every 15 minutes they were taking my blood pressure. And even with prolonged rest, I hadn't really moved. It just wasn't going down. I talked to the nurse and she said, you know, I've seen this type of situation before. I can't give you a definite right now, but more than likely they're going to induce you and you're going to have this baby in the next day or two. And I was like, okay, I better prepare to be here and just stay at the hospital. Luckily, I had packed my diaper bag way, way in advance. But other than that, like none of my stuff and her stuff was packed. We didn't have childcare ready. For Ashley because we just 
we weren't prepared to go in a month early and have a baby. So um, we ended up working out some childcare for Ashley for at least a couple of nights. We thought, you know, it was going to be normal labor and delivery and we'd be out in a couple of days and things would be fine. So we got some childcare for her. I called Andrew and I said, hey, when you're off of work, you should probably swing by the house, shower, make sure the car seat's set up, pack our bags. Here's what I want. Here's who's going to be watching Ashley and then get to the hospital as soon as you can. So I'm sitting in this hospital room and I let him know all of this that I'm going to be staying and here they come with the IV. <laughs> they said your blood pressure is dangerously high. It will probably just continue to get higher, especially with labor and delivery. So we need to give you um, magnesium sulfate. Um, they were like with magnesium sulfate, uh, people experience it very differently. It's usually not the best experience, but this is what you need to protect your brain. The magnesium sulfate was given to me to prevent me from having a stroke or um, seizing because of my blood pressure and toxemia or preeclampsia. So I was like, all right. And they gave me the magnesium sulfate. After they started that IV drip, they also decided to give me fluids just to make sure I was hydrated because my urine was dark in color like it looked like I was dehydrated and I was like you guys I am drinking water like I am drinking water there's no reason why my urine should be dark and so I guess what was happening is my ur my urine my um, fluids were going outside of my vascular system so I wasn't staying hydrated um, and it was storing in my body because like I said before I was swollen and I kept swelling my feet were so puffed out like I like I'm already fat but I looked like a freaking balloon like um, the girl from Willy Wonka the girl who turned into a freaking blueberry I swear that was me so um, they ended up giving me IV fluids and the magnesium sulfate and they were supposed to give me a catheter I begged them not to give me a catheter. I was like, please don't. As long as I can walk, please let me at least get up out of this bed to pee. If I'm not allowed to do anything else, please let me stand up to go to the bathroom. I don't want a catheter. So they let me do that, but I couldn't follow any of my birth plan because I had to be on the freaking magnesium sulfate and my blood pressure, my blood pressure was outrageous. So, um, my birth plan was to use um, the jacuzzi tub and to not get an epidural and to just, you know, for me, getting in water, whether it be like a river or a pool or a shower or a bath, it really helps reduce my pain level. I don't exactly know why. I don't know if it works for everyone, but it definitely works for me. So I was really bummed out that I wasn't able to get into the jacuzzi because that was part of my birth plan. But I was like, please at least let me go to the bathroom. So <laughs> they ended up letting me keep the catheter out and they were like, we'll just measure your urine. I guess another risk of magnesium sulfate is you don't empty your bladder like you're supposed to and then your bladder can literally burst. But I was peeing regularly and they were, you know, checking my levels and whatnot. So um, I was laying there, I was on the magnesium sulfate and this is day one of my labor story, I guess. So Andrew came straight to the hospital because he was riding with a friend. He didn't have his truck. And so he just had them drop him off at the hospital. So he came up to check on me and he was filthy because he works in construction. He was very filthy. Um, he came up, made sure I was good, and then took my car to go home, clean himself up, get Ashley, um, pack our bags, pack Ashley's bags, make sure we have all the baby stuff, and then head to the hospital. So while he got the car perfectly clean, he got the car seat, he got all the things that we needed, and then headed my way. Then he got in a freaking car wreck. Luckily it wasn't too bad. He was okay, Ashley was okay, but the way that they hit my car, um, they hit the back quarter panel and it kind of caved in around the tire so it wasn't drivable, which sucked because then Andrew had to call his friend, get his friend to come pick him up. He had to go home, get his truck. His truck is a work truck, so it was filthy. 
he had to try to clean that out as fast as he could and then head my way. So once he dropped Ashley off and actually got back to the hospital, I think it was like eight or nine o'clock at night. It was pretty late. And I was at the hospital since I think two or three. So at that point he was there and then the doctor came in and looked you know felt my cervix and all that stuff and she's like yeah you're not really dilated it is thinning like your cervix is thinning but you're not really dilated we're probably gonna have to induce you to kind of get the show on the road and I said all right and so they started inducing me and they induced me with the Pitocin standard and they ended up getting me to the highest level of Pitocin for the max amount of time that you can have Pitocin so I was just sitting there and they were like, what's your pain scale? I was like, I don't know, a two or a three. Like they didn't think I was progressing <laughs> at all. And they didn't think I was really even having contractions. Cause like I said, I could feel them, but like my pain was not bad. Apparently I, the whole time I was having full blown contractions. I just have a high pain tolerance. So, um, at that point, the doctor came in, checked my cervix again, and was like, things just really aren't moving very quickly. Um, we need to take you off the Pitocin for a little bit before we can start another round. I would like to do something called miso. And it's basically a little, um, kind of looks like a capsule that they insert inside and it helps basically thin everything out so that things can start happening you can start dilating so she did the miso and then they started me on another round of pitocin and i did progress a little bit but i think i only got to like three centimeters and now we're on day two at this point and so the doctor comes back in i was like you're not really progressing i want to try something else which was essentially manual dilation so what they do for that is they take a balloon, an empty balloon, and they insert it inside of your cervix. Once it's inside, they fill it with, I think, water or some type of saline or whatnot. And then they slowly pull it through your cervix to make you manually dilate. So that was pretty painful, um, but it wasn't like terrible it was just pretty uncomfortable and so she did that um and then i obviously dilated a little bit more because it was manual dilation and then i was on the pitocin again and continued to try to dilate which was also really hard because the best thing to get things moving for dilation is to be like up and moving around and you know walking and squatting and on one of those like exercise balls and I wasn't allowed to do any of that I had to lay in the bed and I had to I could get up and go to the bathroom and that's about it they wouldn't even let me shower which was terrible for me I'm a person who showers every single day and we asked them we were like can I please take a shower like I'll sit on a shower chair Andrew can do it he can help me he's my significant other I'll sit on a shower chair like and for some reason they just wouldn't let me i don't exactly understand they let him do like a bed bath on me which was really embarrassing but they wouldn't let me take a real shower so every time i'd go into the bathroom i would take the wash rags and the towels and just try to wipe my whole body down um especially because uh right after the um manual dilation with the balloon she decided to break my water, which I am not very happy about. I know I'm not a doctor. I know I've never delivered a baby, but what I do know is babies need that fluid to survive in your uterus. If the fluid drains, they die. So once your water breaks, you have a certain amount of time before you have to get that baby out or you will have complications or your baby can die. So the fact that I was dilating very slowly and she decided to break my water anyway really bothers me. Um, I didn't know this at the time. I did a lot of my research after the fact, which sucks, but it is what it is. And so she broke my water and when she broke my water, you guys, no joke, it was like 
it was like in the freaking movies. They always tell you, oh, it's not going to be like in the movies. It's just, you know, it's going to be a little trickle down your leg. Like, it's not going to be the big splash and all over the floor and like a river. Not the case for me. Mine was a freaking river and I <laughs> she popped. She broke my water. My, um, it wasn't my OBGYN. It was OBGYN filling in over the weekend. But she broke my water and it just, like, a river flooded out, right? And I was like, um, um, because she told me it wasn't going to be like that. And I was like, uh, am I peeing myself? <laughs> She said I wasn't, so I didn't pee myself, guys. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was crazy. And so my water was broken. We were trying to get me to go into labor, and that's where we were at on day two. Um, day three rolls around, and I dilated to seven. Actually, it was, yeah, it was day three, because it was like one in the morning. And I got a new set of nurses. Now, on my birth plan, I stated, I'm not totally against having an epidural, but if I don't absolutely need it, I don't want it. You guys, you guys. I got a new set of nurses on, and when they came in, plus I was like sleep deprived and on drugs and on magnesium sulfate, which didn't affect me super horribly, like it can affect people super horribly, but it definitely made me loopy and not completely there. So the new set of nurses come in and they're like, oh, you're seven centimeters dilated. Do you want an epidural? And I was like, mm, no, my pain's not that bad. Uh, if I really need it, I'll get it later. And one of the nurses immediately goes, oh no, it's gonna get worse. You need to get an epidural. Like you should get it now. If you wait too long, you're not gonna be able to get it. Like just freaked me out and told me I needed to get it basically. So despite my plan saying not to do that, she did it anyway. Um, so I was like, uh, okay. And mind you, I didn't really get much education on an epidural since I was a month early. I didn't get to meet with an anesthesiologist. I didn't get to talk to my doctor about the epidural, nothing. So I was just like, okay, well, I guess I'll do it because, you know, you just told me things are going to get awful, even though they weren't terrible. So the anesthesiologist came in at about 1.30, something like that. And you guys, I swear he was drunk. I swear. In the moment, I was like, oh, Christy, you're just crazy. Like, why are you thinking these things in your brain? He's fine. He's a medical professional. Like, don't be that crazy girl, right? Hindsight is 2020. I should have said something. I should have not got the epidural. I should have asked him to stop way, way before he finally did stop. So he comes in and I talked to Andrew about it way later, like a few weeks after. And he's like, yeah, I thought he was drunk too, but I thought I was being crazy as well. So <sighs> terrible experience. So this anesthesiologist comes in and he takes a look at my back and mind you, I was swelling, like just oh, the water weight was insane. I already knew I had a ton of water weight, but over the course of those almost three days, I put on 25 pounds of water weight and I wasn't eating. Like no food crossed my lips besides Jell-O. Um, I had a couple Jell-Os, a couple popsicles, ice chips, water, and I think that's it. Oh, maybe a Sprite. Maybe I had a Sprite too, but that's it you guys for three days. Like, there's no way, even if I was gorging, like, you can't gain 25 pounds of weight in three days. So, I put on 25 pounds of water weight, and so I knew I was just, like, puffed out, swollen. The anesthesiologist comes in, feels my back, and goes, I can't feel your spine. Okay, so don't do it. Don't freaking shove an epidural now that I know exactly what the process of an epidural is. Don't try to shove something in my spine through my nerves. Possibly could cause permanent paralysis if you can't even freaking feel my spine. I'm really still frustrated by this, you guys. 
because it's caused so many problems since my labor and delivery. So remember this, full blown contractions. My pain scale was a two or three, okay? Remember that, out of 10. He started poking me and to figure out where he needed to insert the epidural. He was taking the epidural needle and poking me over and over and over and over again, trying to figure out where the right vertebrae was, where he was supposed to insert this epidural. He probably poked me 18 times, something like that. The first time he tried to insert the epidural, he definitely hit nerves. From the top of my head on the right side of the body, to the tip of my toes, there was a jolt of electricity, like a lightning bolt went through me is what it felt like. And usually when I get hurt, like I stub my toe or something like that, I kind of go, mm. <laughs> like I look like I'm constipated almost, but I don't scream. I might have a few tears well up, but that's about it. When this man hit those nerves in my spine, you guys, I screamed bloody murder and just immediately started sobbing. It was the most horrific pain, like, it was terrible. The only reason why it's not the worst pain I've experienced in my life is because it was so quick to go away. But it was intense, you guys. So that happened and he pulled it out immediately, but then he kept going. He kept trying to figure out where to insert this epidural. He ended up inserting it and then the whole process was finally over. Mind you, two freaking hours, you guys. He was trying to give me an epidural for two hours. Two hours. Should have never happened. Should have never freaking happened. So after he inserts the epidural the second time um, and we're all done, he gives me the bolus. When they first insert it, they give you extra medication to help things along. And then you have a slow amount that goes in every so often. And then, uh, yeah. So he gave me the bolus. And when he first gave me the med, I thought it worked. And I think maybe it was just because some of the pressure was relieved from the position that I was laying in having to sit in to get the epidural, I'm not sure. But um, he gave me the bolus and then he left. And I don't know, at this point it was like 3.30 in the morning or something. And then my pain, remember you guys, my pain was a two or a three. And then my leg just started aching so bad. It was hurting so bad, my right leg. And I was like, you guys, I was telling the nurse, I was like, my leg hurts, my leg hurts, my leg hurts. And they weren't listening to me um and then another nurse was walking by and i was complaining about this for a while you guys because a nine out of ten pain in your leg after your labor pains only being a two or a three is pretty crazy like yeah so another nurse passed by and i told her what was going on and she asked the nurses that were watching over me like has she like she's telling me that her leg hurts basically and it's been hurting for a while. And they're like, she never told us that. And I was like, y'all are straight up lying, like right in front of me. So they finally came over and talked to me and they were like, oh, there's no way the epidural could cause pain in your leg, blah, 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 which makes no sense, none, because you're messing with the nerves in your back. If you mess up those nerves, it can cause pain anywhere in your body. It's your nervous system. Like, are you for real? And so, they were like, we don't know, we'll call the anesthesiologist back. So he came back and I told him what was going on. And he said the same thing. Oh, that couldn't be from the epidural. Uh-huh. Like, are you serious? Are you really like, okay. So he's like, no, can't be from the epidural and gave me another bolus of the medication. Wasn't helping and I was still just, you know, I didn't even care about my freaking labor and delivery pain anymore. I was just like, oh, my freaking leg. Like, and you know what else is crazy about that? They were so sure it wasn't from the epidural. What if that was a DVT? I could have freaking died. Nobody checked about whether or not it was a DVT. So 
anyways, we were sitting there. I was in really bad pain um, from my leg, and I was still trying to dilate. I only ever dilated up to seven centimeters. Um, the OBGYN came in on Monday, mind you. I went in and started being induced on Friday, okay? The OBGYN came in on Monday, and it was Monday morning, and was basically like, we're going to have to get you in for a C-section. The baby is okay right now, but his heart rate is starting to drop down with, like, every contraction, which, tying that back into the fact that she broke my freaking water, of course his heart rate's dropping. He's got almost no more fluid in there to survive on. So, pretty sure I had to have a C-section because she broke my water. I could be wrong. Could have been something else. But I'm pretty sure the reason why I had to have a C-section is because she broke my water too early. I didn't dilate quick enough. And at that point, the baby didn't have enough fluid. So, he was going into distress. So she came in, said that, and I was like, okay. I was in so much pain at that point. I was like, just let's get this over with my leg. I need to cut it off or something. Can we do that while we're doing a C-section? I didn't say that, but it was bad. So they took me back, um, and they were going to let Andrew be in the room for the C-section, except um, the stipulation for that was that everything goes smoothly and blah, blah, blah. So we had a new anesthesiologist at this point because it was the morning. It was daytime on Monday. So went back. My OBGYN was there and the on-call OBGYN that had been seeing me on weekends, all weekend was there as well. So they rolled me back and they give you a stronger med um, in your epidural, in the epidural port if you end up having a c-section and it's supposed to deaden you from like the chest down or something like that so they give me this stronger medication and it did not do a thing so they gave it to me and i could still move my feet i was like hey guys like didn't work i can move my feet i can move my legs i feel everything and so they ended up removing the epidural right then when they removed the epidural, there was so much pain relief that I thought all the pain that had been caused from the epidural was gone. Mind you, everyone kept telling me that that's not possible for the epidural to do that. Obviously not true. So I had a huge wave of pain relief, which was amazing. And then the anesthesiologist said, I have to put you under general. There's no other way to perform this surgery. Um, Andrew can't be in here because we have to put you completely under. I said, okay. So he put the mask over my face. He started doing a countdown. And I remember asking him about being under, not being able to communicate, but potentially feeling all the pain, all the cuts. And he's like, it's a very rare experience. Um, it shouldn't happen. And then I was gone. Like, I was out after that. Um, then my baby was cut out via C-section. And um, I was out. What I was told happened is boys are more prone to have underdeveloped lungs. Even though I was pretty far along at this point. Um, because it had been so many days, I was only about three and a half weeks early. Um, but he still had, his lungs were still slightly underdeveloped, which brings me to another point. I'm not exactly sure why the doctor didn't, there's a steroid injection that they can give you if they know you're going to go into labor early or they have to induce you early to help develop those lungs quickly. And I don't know why the doctors didn't give it to me. No clue. Um, the only thing I can think is maybe it would have caused issues with my blood pressure, which was already insane. They were, they had me on the magnesium sulfate. They had me on, they were giving me blood pressure meds via IV like every half hour. And there were still times where my blood pressure spiked to 200 over 100. So I, I don't know if that was why they couldn't do it, but they didn't. And so when he was born... Um, he wasn't breathing, and 
Um, they had to resuscitate him. I don't know all the details of it because I was asleep. Um, probably better that I was, so I didn't completely freak out. But um, they took him to the nursery and they took me to my room and they had to keep him in the nursery because he was having problems with his lungs. They put him on oxygen and he was stable on oxygen, but because that particular hospital didn't have a NICU, um, they ended up having to um, get a hold of Salem NICU. They were going to send him to Eugene, but Salem is closer to where we live, and so I requested that he go there. So he went to Salem Hospital NICU, um, and at this point he was in the nursery and I was in my room, and I remember waking up and my baby wasn't there and I was like what like they told me as soon as the baby's born we put them in the room with you and since his dad was there I assumed he would be there with his dad and when I woke up um, I remember Andrew was sleeping on the couch because no he wasn't asleep at that point he was in the nursery with Grayson and I came to and um, they told me what had happened and that the baby was going to have to be transferred and that's when we requested Salem and everything. Um, and they, the reason why they, he needed to be transferred is because they didn't have everything they needed to help him develop his lungs if he was going to need more than just air pressure, right? And so I was sitting there trying to wake up from anesthesia, trying to figure out what the hell happened, trying to process everything they were telling me, and yeah, so Andrew came in, I talked to Andrew, and I was just like asking the doctors, is there any way I can see my baby, and I wasn't allowed to get up because I was one of those special cases where despite d delivering, I was still having issues with high blood pressure, so um, they said, we can try to figure out a way for you to see your baby, but we don't know how that's going to work. So I was just sitting there, like, went through this whole traumatic experience, something's happening with my baby. I, at this point, they couldn't tell me whether or not he was going to be okay. And so I was just sitting there like, mm, okay, my baby's in another room, I'm not allowed to get up. What if something happens to him? Oh, I gotta pull it together. Okay, so yeah, um, what ended up happening was... Right before he was transferred to Salem NICU, they brought him into my room. I got to hold his hand and I got to see him and then they had to leave. Um, they left, Andrew left with them because Andrew needed to be with our son. As much as I wanted somebody with me, I wanted somebody with our son more. So he went with our son to be with him and to make sure that, you know, things were happening the way they were supposed to. So, um, after Grayson left, I had some family and I chatted with them and spent some time with them and whatnot. Uh, but I was pretty much just on the bed. I was still so, so, so swollen that I couldn't really move. Like, you know how the hospital beds are and there's buttons on the side of them to, like, lift your bed, lay your bed down? I could barely, like, shift my body to press those buttons because I was just... Like I said, I swear I was, like, the blueberry girl in Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory. It was terrible. And then um, the next day, I believe it was the next day, the nurse that I first had that I really, really liked a lot came in and she was like, hey, how's it going? And I just talked to her about the whole thing. And um, she told me that I needed to be up and be walking. And I told her about the pain in my leg and how bad it was. And now it's better, but it was still affecting me. Like, my leg was still hurting it wasn't all the time but it definitely like whenever like the sheet would brush up against my leg or anything like that it hurt and so she freaked out and she's like nobody's looked at that and i was like no and she was the one who was like oh, let's get an ultrasound on that and you know it could be a dvt we need to make sure that it's not and luckily it wasn't and it's obviously a nerve issue i still have issues with that leg it's gotten better, but I still have issues. Um, and she's like, all right, well, now that we know there's no DVT, you, the best thing for healing is to get up and move around. 
And I was like, all right, I just haven't because all the other nurses have told me, you know, don't get out of bed. Your blood pressure is still insane. <laughs> so I started walking around a little bit, walking around my room at first. And then I had this really weird experience where instead of getting a few flashers across my eyes, it was like a swarm of them and I almost couldn't see anymore. And so I called the nurse in, they took my blood pressure, it was 200 over 100, and at this point I didn't have um, the magnesium drip, so I think that's why I saw all those flashers with my blood pressure that high, is because my brain was no longer protected from stroke or seizure. And so they immediately injected my IV with more blood pressure meds, and then I was taking blood pressure meds as a PRN, and then I also had a regularly prescribed blood pressure med that I was taking twice a day. And then the next day I saw another doctor, um, and he prescribed me another blood pressure med. And so at that point, I was on two different blood pressure meds three or four times a day to try to keep it down and even with all of those it's like my body was resistant to the medication because even with all those meds my blood pressure was still sitting at like 165 over 95 so it was still pretty bad um and so i just kind of sat in the hospital losing my mind because i couldn't see my baby and i was alone most of the time when people came to see me it was a nice distraction and I really appreciate them when they were able to come and see me, you know, because it was helpful, but that's a lot of time. Like, you, most people can't just sit there and be with you. Like, it's just not really reasonable. Um, so I had a lot of time to just kind of sit there and be paranoid and think about things and to be sad. And plus I had all these crazy hormones going on from just having a baby. Sorry, I'm messing with my hair. It's like, mm, coping mechanism. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I was just sitting there and by the third day, the nurse came in and was like, we're not going to be able to discharge you today. It's not going to happen. And I literally broke down that day. Like for the first time in my life, I got so sad and upset that I couldn't, I didn't want to eat even, which is weird for me because I'm usually, I don't know, sometimes I'm the opposite. It's confusing. But my doctor came in and ended up releasing me, and that, from that moment on, that's kind of what has kicked off a lot of my health issues, which I'll talk about in other videos. I know this video is extremely long, but that was my labor and delivery story. Um, it was a rough one, and I really want to have another baby. I would like to try for a girl, but I'm so afraid of that happening again and having these long-term issues after that I've had, or maybe them getting worse, that I'm really afraid to try again. So if any of you guys have had negative experiences in pregnancy, labor, delivery, maybe preeclampsia, maybe a messed up epidural, or whatever medical issues in your first pregnancy and then had another pregnancy that went just fine like a-okay please let me know in the comments below um, let me know your guys' experience let me know what your thoughts are if you have any questions um, just let me know if you're new here please hit the subscribe button and the notification bell give it a big thumbs up if you enjoyed this video I know it was kind of not the most pleasant video, but I'm just trying to share my experience with you guys. Um, anyways, I hope you enjoyed, and I will talk to you guys later. Bye, B-Squad.